Okay. Was this uh, last year when the lights would go off in here on the timer? Is that is that still in play? I'm probably gonna sneak in. Um, All right, Patrick, you want to start us off today? Sure thing. Good afternoon, buddy. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, Patrick. I'm sorry, can you hear me, buddy? Hello? One second. Go ahead, Patrick. Okay, now, can you hear me now, buddy? Got you now, Patrick. Okay, cool. Are Thanks. you leading off? I am. I got the seat of power today. You're the lid lifter, seat of power. I, I am the lid lifter. <laughs> I have a couple kind of uh, off the wall topics to start today, if you don't mind. No problem. One of them, I don't know if you saw the news or not, uh, that I, one of the independent leagues, and I think it's the Continental League, but I've forgotten which one, they're going to experiment beginning in August with moving the pitching rubber back a foot. Wow. So rather than 60 feet, six inches, 61 feet, six inches. I'm curious what your reaction is to that. Of course, it's just experimental. Yeah. But I'm wondering what your take is on that. Well, again, I've, you know, I've heard a lot of the creative ideas to enhance, I think more than anything, ball and play, right? That's the, that's the thing that you know, fans seem through polling want to happen. Balls in play. Uh, this should help for sure, Patrick. It's, it's going to give, you know, hitters another 12 inches to, to see the baseball. Uh, you know, when the when the ball comes out of the hand, uh, by the time to, by the time it gets to the hitting area, the the velocity decreases. Uh, you know, what's going to be a little different, which you know I want to see is you know, the breaking pitches and how that uh, affects each and every pitcher with their breaking stuff. Because pitchers over the years have been throwing, you know, from 60 feet, six inches, and their breaking pitches have been uh, honed uh, to break, you know, near or around the plate. Now it's going to be a little different. But I think that the concept uh, moving it back will definitely help balls in play. You know, I'm, I'm going to have to see it first to see whether, uh, you know, I like it or not to see, you know, what difference it makes. That seems like a lot of foot to me, uh, you know, right out of the chute. But might as well uh, see where that goes as opposed to maybe six inches first and then a foot. Uh, but I'm, I'm curious to see how this, this works. I think it's going to be in the Atlantic League. Atlantic, that's right. right. Yeah, uh, which I think where a lot of these – creative ideas sort of uh, first get first get tested but you know let, let's do it let's 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 be creative let's try it and see what it looks like I'm not opposed to that uh, you know again I think baseball is listening to what fans are saying and 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 doing what they can to you know maybe enhance the you know enhance the offense and then enhance action so the baseball purist in you is not going to dismiss this out of hand. Not out of hand, no. I'm no. not. Even though uh, I'm like you, I'm a purist. Uh, you know, I, I do like the dimensions as they are. Uh, I don't know where, I don't know where pitcher stuff is going to be 50 years from now. Uh, you know, this might be a good thing that's happening now, right? I mean, not sure. our pitchers going to, our pitchers going to throw 100 miles an hour, 105 miles an hour, pretty regularly. 50 years from now, possibly. Uh, I know it's very hard to hit now uh, from, you know, 60 feet, six inches, you know, with a lot of, you know, with a lot of pitchers with great stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay having to look at this in this, uh, you know, in this Atlanta, Atlantic League situation. Okay, cool. My other question um, is about uh, Jake McGee. 
and I probably should have asked you this during the Giant series. He's off to a terrific start with them, and he's primarily become a fastball pitcher again, like he was back in Tampa. Uh, do you think it's a matter of him finally fully being healthy? I know he had a lot of knee pain and issues during much of his time in Colorado. Uh, and I, I don't know if he's not asking for inside info or anything, but do you think that could be a component as to why he's pitching so well for San Francisco? You know, I, I think that I, I think that's definitely part of it. You know, I think there's probably a lot of things that are adding up for Jake and, and health might be, you know, completely, uh, you know, a big part of it. I know that, uh, you know, I don't think he's pitching with a knee brace now. Uh, I know that he did with us and he was troublesome. Uh, I think last year in L.A., I think he, he wore a brace at times. I'd have to, you know, go back and check. But, uh, you know, it looks as though uh, his velocity is back. To where it was, you know, I think in the early years of his being, of him being a Rocky, and you're right, it's primarily a, a fastball attack. And I think more than anything, uh, you know, because of maybe the increased velocity, maybe the overall body's feeling better, and the overall su uh, success that, that he had with the Dodgers and now, uh, you know, with the Giants is, is giving him a great deal of confidence just, you know, to pump that fastball with with the extra velo he has and, and, and to really attack hitters. I think that was, uh, you know, something with, uh, you know, with us is, you know, his control and command was a little variable. I think the walk rate was always pretty good. You know, there wasn't a lot of walks, uh, you know, and there was, you know, the strikeout rate was pretty solid, but the overall stuff, uh, you know, was maybe down a little bit with us in, in 19, 18 and 19. Okay. One more for me. You've talked quite a bit about C.J. Crone, your belief he's eventually going to get going. Right. Charlie's scuffing a little bit, too. We know his track record. Uh, do you think Charlie is just missing? Is he just an early season funk? What can you tell us about Charlie? Yeah, well, well, I think, you know, there's a few guys. Uh, you know, we haven't, we haven't clicked on all cylinders uh, with a number of our position players, as you know. We've talked about that. I mean, Mac being one guy who's been off to a good start and, you know, Tappy is hovering. Well, he was hovering around 300 up until last night, uh, you know, with some, you know, pretty good games the last few games. But as it relates to Chuck, I think that, uh, you know, he's just, you know, any time that you're seeing, the, you're seeing foul balls uh, from Chuck, uh, that just means his timing's off just a little bit. And uh, whether he's, you know, out front of a pitch and, and pulling it foul or maybe just a tick late and, and fouling it straight back or a little bit potentially over their dugout. That just tell me, that tells me that his timing's off. But, you know, I, I see bat, bat speed, I see pitch recognition. Uh, I just see timing just a little bit off. And when, you're, when your timing's off, you're, gonna, you're not gonna see consistently uh, hard hit balls put in play. Great, thanks buddy. Yeah. Nate Broke. Yeah, hey buddy, to follow up on Patrick, um, you know, some of the baseball's efforts to, um, yeah, like you said, put the ball in play, get, get away from the true outcomes. When we've talked, can you correct me if I'm wrong um, or maybe expand on this? I seem to remember when we've talked to you about this before that um, it's kind of your, it's sort of your belief that, um, that baseball has a way of, of correcting itself. Yes. Like, you know, the, the, the trend will go back to people putting the ball in play naturally as an advantage against so many strikeouts and you know and for instance is that is that am i do I'm that's still that's still a belief in mine uh and and that takes time it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight it doesn't happen over a couple year period uh it happens over time and it starts you know it, it starts with amateur players it starts with high school kids travel ball kids now uh, collegiate level minor league level i think there is a there'll be a correction. Uh, you know, I don't know whether, I don't think cyclical is a word. I think it's more of an adjustment that, that will be made by teams and players uh, as it relates to putting the ball in play. Cutting the strikeouts down definitely, I think, will, will correct itself. Unless, you know, we continue to see this trend of, of, of better stuff. And that's, that's what, uh, 
you know, gives me a little bit of pause on this is that, you know, where is uh, the velocity going with our pitchers? Where are the velocities with the secondary pitches going? Uh, we've seen an increase, you know, over the last 15 years. And then most recently, I think the last five years where, you know, scouting scales, scouting grades have changed, uh, you know, based on velocities and, you know, sliders, curveballs, the quality of the velocities of. Uh, that's what gives me pause, whether these numbers are, are going to continue to climb because of the, you know, the athlete that is, you know, coming into all sports, you know, the bigger, stronger, faster. That's where I have a little bit of pause. You know, where where's the athlete going to be five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, you know, what is an average fastball going to look like 10 years from now? Uh, because we've seen a big jump. There's no doubt about it in the last five years. So just like philosophically speaking, because this I don't even know how you would quantify this, but do you, I mean, do you think hitters just out on a basic level that hitters can't eventually keep up with, with the. Well, I, yeah. I mean, it's hard to hit anyway, right? It's, it's, it's one of the hardest things to do in all sports. And I'm not sure whether, you know, physically you can, you can consistently catch up to, you know, fastballs that are approaching hundred miles an hour. And if you have secondary pitches, you know, in the, in the low nineties, you know, that's, that's my concern, whether you can physically do it. Gotcha. It's fascinating. Thank you, buddy. Thomas, go ahead. Yeah. A couple along those lines, buddy. Um, they tested some college pitchers at different distances and it seemed like it didn't change their mechanics, but if you were pitching somewhere, and they set the mound at 61 feet, six inches. Would you know it right there on the mound? Would you know it and feel it? Yeah, I would know it. Yeah, you would definitely know it. Uh, you know, you would, you might not know it on your, on your fastball, uh, but you would know it on your, you'd know it on your breaking pitches. You wouldn't really, you'd probably see a little bit of a result on your changeup. You know, it depends on, you know, the type of changeup you have, but you would definitely know it, you know, watching the, you know, the, uh, you know, the end of your slider, the end of your curveball, uh, the end of your slurve, uh, you would, you would definitely notice a difference. And that would, that would require a different uh, release point. Uh, I mean, your, you know, your delivery wouldn't change. It, you know, your release point uh, would have to be readjusted. Yeah, I would imagine too, that would probably give away the pitch. So that would make it a little bit easier. But it would be, the pitch would be, you'd be able to, as a hitter, you'd be able to, you know, wait just a little bit longer because you could, you've got another foot to watch the ball. Um, also the, the other rule, the one that you talked about, and then I don't know if it was you or or Jason Stark or both of you, but the idea of the um, of, of the double hook, the DH um, coming out when the starting pitcher, could that even without changing the mound, kind of revolutionize the game to where maybe the pitcher is not there just blowing out early in a game because he has to go deeper for his team. Well, it it, it really uh, puts an emphasis on you know starters being able to to throw longer, right, uh, in a ball game to, to, to make sure that there's at least a couple of at-bats from a big bat. Uh, you know, the only thing that uh, worried me a little bit is that, uh, you know, whether that makes the uh, strong get stronger and the weak get weaker, right? If you have a strong team, uh, you know, usually that team has a pretty strong rotation and does it help that team more, uh, you know, than, you know, the balance of the, how much is it, does it weaken a weaker team with a lesser rotation against a team with a really strong rotation? You know, good teams usually have strong rotations. And, uh, and here it is, they're able to keep that big bat maybe in there another at bat longer. 
than a than a team that might be, uh, you know, in a in a little cycle of uh, of not having a good rotation and their guy get knocked out and uh, you lose that bat and you're going to get, uh, you know a good team that gets you know potentially three at bats with a you know with a good starting pitcher with a DH and a, a team with a poor rotation. You know they're at a disadvantage because maybe they only got you know one at bat. I mean that's that's the only thing that that bothers me a little bit about this is that uh, you know does it make the strong stronger and the weak weaker? Oh, in that well, in that in that scenario, which I think common sense tells me it does. Okay. But it does. But it does incentivize uh, you know pitchers you know condition to to throw more pitches, you know, organizations building starting pitching to, uh, you know, to throw more innings, to, to get more outs, you know, to keep that bat in the lineup. Well, it, I guess philosophically, does it work to how you manage? Because you, you look at the innings pitched, I think, last season and also back in 18, you guys were up at the top of the league where maybe actually that could give you an advantage as opposed to maybe a team with more money. Yeah, well, no, it gives the team advantage with a good rotation. And usually teams that are good have good rotation. Hey, um, that's right. I mean, I, I feel, you know, uh, you know, for us, I think right now, presently, I think we'd be fine because I, you know, I like our group of, I like our group of starters. I think they're, you know, they're built to be durable and they're, they're built to get a lot of outs. Other rotations, maybe not so much. Okay. Hey, as far as, um, this team is concerned. First road trip, it's it's early, but with you guys struggling a bit out of the gate, you could say it's a little bit of a stress point. How much do do you watch, especially your younger guys or even the guys that are kind of entering that entering the middle of their careers to see who your leaders are, see who handles the stress better? Well, we you know we watch all our guys. I think that you know, this group of players, I, I know that you guys haven't been around them, you know, on a personal level, but you guys are, you guys know them well enough to know what type of people they are, and, uh, you know, the care factor that they have for this, for this club. Uh, you know, I, I worry about them not, you know, getting, uh, you know, too discouraged too early because it's a long year. Uh, it truly is. And we have some guys who are off to slow starts and I, I don't want them to beat themselves up and have that affect their performance. Uh, you know, we feel that a lot of guys are going to, you know, end up, you know, doing what they do, which, uh, you know, I think for them is, uh, you know, uh, you know, their own big league performance. Uh, I just don't want them to, uh, you know, beat themselves up to the point where it's affecting their performance. And that's, there's a fine line there. Okay. And Hey, just um, one thing on McMahon, you, you, we've seen some power out of him and the attitude that he's looking for those opportunities to really, drive a ball um what what is the growth factor that you've seen in him even from spring training to now yeah i think we've seen you know we've seen growth in mac every year uh, i think now we're starting to see some signs with the swing uh you know his at bats uh, that lead us to believe <laughs> closer to you know fulfilling the potential that I think Mac know, knows know he knows he has and, and what we think he has. So, uh, and it takes time. I think he has just under a thousand at bats. And usually for me, it's you know that, uh, that thousand to fifteen hundred level of at bats when a guy really starts to get what he needs to do with his swing, with his mechanics, uh, with his approach, with his thought process. You know, to really put his skill set to use, and I think Mac's getting to that point. And final follow up with Mac. In addition to the home runs we've seen, I think the last couple of games there was that drive in um, San Francisco that that moved the runners. There was the ground ball last night moved the runners. I mean, are you seeing that thought process and those type of at bats yeah. increase? Yeah. Well, that, you know, I thought the at bat in San Francisco was a good one. Uh, again, he drove that ball move the runners to second and third with, you know, there were no outs when he had to, got them over in a, in a close game. Yeah. The, the, you know, what we need from all our guys, Mac included, is that success rate of situational hitting, you know, Mac, you know, Mac did his job and then, uh, you know, Josh had a, a tough punch out and Hilliard punched out after that, but, 
again, as a group, we have, we have to have a success rate of, of situational hitting. And I think our guys understand that. Uh, are we going to be 100%? No, but, you know, the percentage rate of success has to be, you know, for me, well over, well over 60. Uh, you know, beyond that, that's sort of league, av league average. But, you know, Mac is starting to understand, you know, his game and how it relates to helping us win. And he's doing it and he's conscious of it, which is great. Thanks, buddy. Kevin, go ahead. Hey, buddy. I wanted to ask you a quick question about Austin Gomber. It's a it's a small sample size and it's early, but he's among the uh, league leaders in uh, the least hard hit uh, whenever balls put into play. Is that mixing pitches, location? What what are you seeing that's contributing to that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, a couple of things I agree with. It's early, but it is a good sign. I like that. Uh, you know, the walks are a little high, Kevin. We got, we got to bring those down, but, you know, I think it's more of a factor of, uh, you know, his mix of pitches, you know, he's got four, I feel quality major league pitchers, you know, the fastball has enough velocity. Uh, he's able to move it around the strike zone, the, the, the hook, the curve balls well above average pitch has great spin, good depth to it. It's big. He's got to be able to throw that for a called strike and he's got to get some swings on it. Uh, the change, I think, is developing. It's not, <clears throat> you know, to the point where he feels super, super comfortable with it, but I think he's gaining confidence in it. And his little slider cutter is a quality pitch, too. So I think I think his mix of pitches is, is probably uh, the reason why you're seeing the, you know, the, you know not a lot of hard hit balls, uh, last exit velocity, you know, whatever in these two starts, but you know, the potential's in there to, you know, retain those sorts of numbers. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Go ahead, Drew. Hey, buddy, you got a comp on, on Dustin May from what you've uh, seen thus far? Dustin May. Jeez, let me see. Tall, thin. Big arm, big sinker, uh, big vela. I mean, maybe a little bit of Kevin Brown, maybe. I thought, I uh, thought you may go there. Yeah, a little bit of Kevin Brown. Uh, you know, I, think, I think Kevin was, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more slider. Maybe a few more sliders than, than May, but, you know, uh, I mean, it's that, you know, tall, uh, lean, uh, you know, moving fastball, you know, running fastball. When it's down, it sinks. You know, it's tough to dig out when it's low in the strike zone. And the, and the slider is developing. I think, you know, you know, it took a while for Kevin to – to develop his, you know, his mix of the, the heavy sinker, hard fastball with a slider. Uh, you know, this guy's throwing a little bit now, but uh, trying to throw a little bit of a straighter fastball that cuts, we can call it a cutter, uh, to go along with that, you know, more of a breaking ball type slider. But I'd say Kevin Brown probably stuff-wise is a, is a comp. Where is he missing his bats more this year than a year ago? I think, you know, both sides of the plate command. I think last year it was more sort of arm side into the righty away, away to the lefty. Uh, heavy doses of that. I think he's more proficient now of getting in on lefties and, and throwing that fastball away to righties and keeping it on the outside corner and not having it come back to the middle. So I think the, the fastball command is probably better. Gotcha. Thanks, buddy. Yeah. All right, last one with Tracy. Buddy, on Gomber, Gomber um, you hear different things, you read reports, but to actually see him in action and to see him command those four pitches, has that been uh, more than you might have anticipated? Well, I, uh, you know, just from watching video and then, you know, getting to know him, you know, each and every day in spring training and then through these first two starts, I think that, you know, I, I think there's a uh, there's room to grow there as a pitcher as far as 
you know, his control and command. I think there's, uh, there's upside there to improve on that, which will make him a better pitcher. I think we've seen uh, in these two starts a little bit of, especially the first one, you know, a little bit of uh, two variable uh, command and control. Uh, you know, he reeled it in a little bit better in San Francisco on, on their opening day on Thursday. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, you know, I think for him that, you know, his challenge is to, you know, get the ball in the strike zone a little bit more consistently because I think the stuff plays. And I like the fact that in San Francisco, the, the, the changeup was much better. Uh, he had more confidence in it because I think that's going to, that's going to help his fastball. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Austin Gomber is coming up next. We're going to stay here on this same Zoom for pregame. All right, we have Austin Gomber here. Patrick, do you want to start us off? Sure, will do. Hi, Austin. How are you today? Good. How are you? Good. I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Buddy to start off. I'm not sure you're aware of this, but uh, an independent minor league is going to experiment later this year, moving the pitching rubber back a full foot. Uh, just an experiment to see how you know, more balls in play, et cetera. As a guy who's brought up on 60 feet, six inches, as opposed to 61 feet, six inches, what do you think about that idea? Um, not obviously, it probably wouldn't happen in your career, but you never know. Yeah, honestly, I haven't given too much thought about it. I, I never, I didn't see that. Um, I'd have to look into it a little bit more, but I'd imagine it would change a lot of things. Um, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but 12 inches is a ton, you know, when it comes to pitching specifically. So um, <clears throat> I would be interested if they ran some, to see some data, you know, after, I guess after their season, whatever league's doing it to see to see how the changes are. But I would imagine that that would kind of, you know, almost give a facelift to the game. Okay, cool. Hey, um, and this isn't directed you, you specifically, but I know Bud Black and, and the pitching coaches have been concerned about the high walk rate for this team. Uh, you certainly did much better your second start. Um, what does a pitcher do when – Maybe they're off a little bit and they are walking too many. Um, are there certain keys that you need to hone in on to, to harness those walks and, and, you know, and not let, let that number rise? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's, there's different kinds of walks, right? I mean, in San Francisco, I think I had four walks but two of them were in the seventh inning. So if I would have only walked the one guy in the seventh inning and then got a ground ball and got out of the inning with three walks through seven innings, I don't think it would have been more – like it wouldn't have been talked about as much, you know what I mean? I think it's it's kind of when you walk guys maybe, but as long as you're not stacking them, right? Because if, if you're giving up – now if you're walking guys and giving up a lot of hits, then that's, that's, kind, of the, that's kind of the gray line where you, you got to, you know – kind of balance right because if it's walks or hits and you're not scattering them right like if I throw eight innings and I give up 10 hits but they're all singles and none of them are back to back to back then it doesn't really affect me I think it's kind of similar with walks right if I throw seven innings and I walk three guys and it's one guy in the second one guy in the fourth one guy in the seventh none of them score then that's a whole different thing than walking three guys like my first start walking two and three guys in the same inning so I think it's all about really about like when it happens um, how it happens, four pitch walks, but if it's a 10, 11 pitch out bat, they got fouls five or six pitches off, but then you make a mistake or you throw a ball in the dirt. I mean, like, I don't characteristic, like, characterize that as a, as a bad walk per se. So I think it's more about, you know, when they're happening, who they're happening to, are they stacking up, you know, how they look. There's a lot of things that go into it. And one more on that topic. Uh, on your side sessions, your off day, your bullpen, whatever you want to call it, if you're in a in a time when you're you are walking more than you want to I know it's going to vary from pitcher to pitcher 
do you first look at mechanical stuff and then clear that and say, okay, well, this is kind of why I'm just a little bit off? Or do you mostly look at it from a, you know, a, a mental <laughs> aspect? Or is, it, is that difficult to pinpoint? Again, I think it just varies on the situation, right? I think sometimes there's, you know, you could go in after an outing and like my first outing against LA, when I walked a lot of people, you know, I think it was part mentally me just trying to do too much and part that mentally being sped up, trying to do too much, like literally sped up my delivery. So then my timing was off. So then you can point to it and be like, well, it's a little bit of both, right? Because mentally I'm trying to do too much. So maybe I'm overthrowing and that's also causing me to speed up, which is mechanically affecting me. But I think a lot of the times it's more times than not with walks. I think it's more mental. It's more of like, you know, maybe trying not to get hit or trying to be too perfect, too fine with your pitches rather than just, you know, attacking the big part of the plate per se. But um, yeah, I think it's just kind of situationally based. Great. Great answer. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thomas. Yeah, one to follow up kind of on Patrick. How did you evaluate the last outing in San Francisco? Just when you walked in and, the, you know, I'm, I'm taking all of my stats and everything out of it. When you walked in and looked at the video and thought about it, how did you evaluate that? I thought it was a really good start. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep, you know, less than one base runner an inning is kind of a goal for me, right? So if I throw seven innings, kind of seven or less base runners, that day I gave, I think I threw six and a third. I had four walks and one hit. So I, I accomplished that goal. Um, you know, those two runs that I left on base were able to score, but we still only gave up two runs. So we're still in the game there, right? Um, obviously, Cueto threw the ball unbelievable that day, but, you know, that's out of my control, right? I'm trying to do what I what I can control. So if I – and I can control going out there throwing six or seven innings and giving up two runs and only four or five base runners, then to me that's a good outing, right? I can't control whether the other pitcher pitches well, whether we score, whether we don't score. Um, you know, my job is just to go out there and get out. So, you know, from that standpoint, I'm not – I wasn't thrilled about, like I said, like stacking the walks in the seventh inning, going walk, strike out, walk. But, you know, overall to keep, you know, five base runners and six and a third on the road and only give up two, I mean, felt, felt like I kept this in the game. And coming off of my first outing, I was definitely pleased with it and just continuing to try to build on it going forward. Um, as far as the rules in the Atlantic League, the other rule that uh, they're going to experiment with is you get the DH as long as your starting pitcher stays in the game. You as a starting pitcher, would you like that as far as incentivizing going deeper for the starter? Because you see so many teams that go that basically tell the guy, hey, go blow it out for three or four innings or you have an opener or whatever. Would you like to have uh, the length of the game kind of incentivized that way? Yeah, I think that's uh, – I haven't seen that one either, but that one, that's more kind of middle ground, right, because you have, like, two parties, people that want to see the DH and want to bring more offense into the game, and then kind of the people that would be, I guess, consider themselves more purist, you know, maybe National League fans, and I guess it's a little bit of both, right, because at the end of the day, the relievers don't really hit anyways. All right, so like once I come out of the game and the relievers come in, we're typically pitch hitting for them almost every single time their spot comes up or double switching. So I don't think like from like an actual gameplay, like if you were to put that rule in, I don't think it actually changes the game that much. I mean, you know, whether it incentivizes, you know, to, to take the pitcher out or keep the pitcher in, but, you know, it's the way I see it, I don't know. I mean, typically around the league, you don't really see a lot of relievers getting that bats anyway. So I think that's a, you know, kind of a happy medium, a way to, you know, keep the traditional rules of the game going while also, you know, being a little bit more progressive with the DH. And the last one, I'm on the, uh, on the moving the mound back a foot. They tested it with some college pitchers. I think uh, Dr. James Andrews was involved in it. And he said, it doesn't change your mechanics moving back a foot. Um, I, I talked to Buddy a bit, and he was saying that it would change some release points on some breaking pitches. If they moved, two questions. One, if they moved the mound back a foot and didn't tell you, would you know the difference? And two, what would be the adjustments after you knew they moved the mound back a foot? Or the rubber back a foot? That's a good question. Um, I don't know that you would notice a difference right away, to be honest with you. 
a lot um because everywhere it's different right so like every stadium the depth perception is is different so like it doesn't always look the same right it's 60 feet six inches but when i get up on the mound at cores it looks different you know distance wise than it does here than it does in san francisco and so on so i think at first you might be able to but i think you know when guys will start to realize it's like what you're seeing with breaking balls because like at this point most guys like i got a good enough feel to like know when i throw a good breaking ball and kind of where it typically finishes and then if it doesn't finish there if it finishes way short i think that would be the biggest difference um you know, I'd be, like I said, I'd be interested to see, like, kind of, like, the statistics around it, like, if it really does help hitting that much or if it, you know, hurts pitching that much. Um, it's only for, like, from a medical standpoint, I don't think it would have that much of a difference, but I think it's more of, like, in-game and, like, commanding the ball because you're working with such a finite amount of inches and centimeters on the sides of the plate that when you, you know, you change the, you know, the launch place by 12 inches, it really can change a lot of things. Thanks, Austin. Yeah. Kevin Henry. Hey, Austin. Thanks for the time. Um, I know it's early in the season, but the, the advanced metrics are saying that your hard hit rate, your barrel rate's among the lowest in the majors right now. To you, does that say something about you're mixing up pitches or your pitches are being located in the right spot when, when they're in there? Or what, what, is, what does that say to you? Uh. I mean, honestly, that just says that guys aren't hitting the ball really hard. Um, you know, that could be a plethora of different reasons. I think part of it is probably that I'm not, you know, so reliant on one pitch. Mm -hmm. um, I'm more, you know, going to be more spread around if you look at percentages of, like, pitches thrown. My, my arsenal is going to be more evenly separated than a lot of other guys. Uh, quite candidly, the first start, I didn't throw a whole lot of strikes. And right. get a lot of there's not a lot of chances for guys to hit the ball so that you know that data might be skewed a little bit um you know I definitely feel like when I'm right I could you know limit limit hard contact um and be one of the better one of the better players in the league at it but I mean at this point I feel like it's a little too early to kind of you know start you know really taking you know taking weight and what that what those numbers say but I mean it's definitely encouraging and um you know looking at numbers like that should help you, you know, be able to you know, be confident in your stuff and attack the strike zone. Are, are you a guy that it takes a certain number of starts in a season before you really start to say, okay, there's some cause and relationship here. Some relationship with what? Well, with, with like any kind of statistics or anything like that, uh, you know? Um, I mean, I think the more I've been, you know, the older I've gotten, the more I've been around the game. I think I've realized that like every start is so different. Like they all take a take a life of their own, right? I mean, you have times where you know, a couple starts in a row where you feel awful, and then all of a sudden one day you you're amazing and you throw seven shutout, and then vice versa, you feel like you haven't missed a spot in a week. Because like I hadn't thrown really any balls all spring training, and then I get my first start of the year and I can't find the strike zone, right? So like learning to just separate each outing from one and the other, right? So like my outing in LA was what it was. And then my outing in San Francisco, it was what it was. And now, you know, tomorrow night we'll, you know, just evaluate that outing for what it was that day. And then I think, you know, like you said, I guess, yeah, when you get more starts, you know, if you have three, four starts and you notice like when you're reviewing your outings, like, man, like the last three or four starts, I'm doing the same thing. I don't have my slider for three or four starts. I think that's when you start to like, all right, we need to work specifically on that. Okay. But like from a start to start basis, a lot of times like game plans change. So like, you know, maybe my one pitch isn't as good this start as it was last start, but my game plan was not to really throw it as much. So it's not going to be as sharp. So there's, there's a lot of things that go into it, but, um, you know, I think once you get, obviously get more of a rhythm, it's easier to kind of identify, you know, things that you're struggling with regularly and things that, you know, maybe you just had a bad day. Thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Anything else for Austin? All right. Thanks, Austin. Thanks, everyone. We'll see y'all folks.